The study is on page 15. Page 15. The theme is servant leadership. And our text is John chapter 13. John chapter 13. If there is time, I would love that uh, at the close of the study, we sing the hymn, Come Down, O Love Divine. If we can have it projected on the screen and the organist could also play for us. As a word of general introduction, which is on page 15, uh, we notice that Jesus has been doing some wonderful, exciting things before now. He's been turning water into wine, opening the eyes of the blind, raising even the dead. But in chapter 13 of St. John's Gospel, he did something spectacular, something extraordinary, something that nobody of his status, of his caliber had done before. What did he do? He stooped low to wash the feet of his disciples. And so this caused a stare, you know, amongst the disciples. It was like, no, this is not done. Why? Because this was a tax reserved for slaves. Not just servants, but slaves. And you must understand that Slaves and servants are not the same in the Jewish custom or tradition in Palestine. A servant was one who was paid for doing the job which he did. And a servant could go back home after the close of a day. But the slave never received any wages. A slave had no time for themselves. A slave woke up and waited on their master to tell them what to do. They had no closing time. And a slave his children would also become slaves. So Jesus took upon himself that task that was not meant for him. Secondly, he wanted to change the narrative to break the status quo. For them in that time of their world, servants were bosses. Servants were those who, lorded, who, who, you know, who would really lord it over their subjects. But Jesus said, no, let me reverse it. Let me turn it around. So these two points made it spectacular. It was an act of sacrifice, an act of humility. And you would just take your time to read the general introduction. And the paragraphs have the main points. But let me just read one of the paragraphs, which is towards the end. To Jesus, greatness and power were not measured by the number of people serving a leader, but the extent that the leader was serving the people under him or her. That was key for Jesus. Also for Jesus, servant leadership defines that timeless, changeless style and attitude that must be present in our lives as Christians. So he demonstrated what he did to leave an example for the disciples. The essence and the style and the attitude of servant leadership is what we find in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 to 5. Jesus being the same as God, but did not count it as a sin to compete for, to, you know, to struggle for, to want to take by force. But what did he do? He humbled himself to the point of suffering, to the point of even dying on the cross. And the death on the cross, we know what it means. And so, in Christian service and ministry, the only acceptable style and attitude of leadership is that of servant leadership. There is no room for king leadership in, in Christian leadership. Self, selfish leadership has no basis. Leadership and self-serving leaders have no room. Position does not ever give us the right to lord it over anyone. We must see position as a privilege, position as a calling, position as a ministry. To do what? To serve. To declare the mind of God, the mandate of God, with kingdom perspective in focus. Jesus never lost sight of the kingdom. All that he did, all that he demonstrated was for the sake of the kingdom. That the kingdom might come and be born in the hearts of men. And that this same kingdom be extended to other people. And so everything he did was not about his position. 
or his person, it was about service. Study one, the topic is definition and characteristics of servant leadership. The same text, John 13, 1 to 38, and the aims are there to give a clear definition of servant leadership and two, to show the marks, the characteristics and nature of servant leadership. Generally, in the Christian world, it is believed and understood that the best style of leadership is servant leadership. But sometimes people begin to argue, what does a servant leader do? In our introduction, we see it there. A servant leader washes the feet of his subjects. And we can understand this in various forms. As we go ahead, we will see details. A servant leader also rebukes. There's a place to rebuke. When things are not done properly or things are not going right, a servant leader does not become passive, docile, and does nothing. He takes up the responsibility to rebuke. I and mean, we saw Paul doing that in Galatians to Peter, even publicly. A servant leader also disciplines. He does not just rebuke, but if there's need for discipline, need to punish people. When I say punish, I mean, you know, bring them under, you know, authority to the point that they understand that this is not about you as a person, but about the kingdom, about God, and about the work of ministry. And that this can affect the lives of people in terms of eternity. Therefore, they must be disciplined. So a servant leader does that. And sometimes a servant leader serves at their own expense. They're not waiting to be paid. They're not sometimes even looking for gratis. They simply put out themselves, put out their time, put out their money, put out their resources. And we saw Jesus doing this. He says, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd does what? Lays down his life for the sheep. He didn't do anything because he wanted glory. He already had glory. But what he did was to empty his glory for the sake of the kingdom. And then servant leaders also issue strong imperative. So a servant leader is not somebody who is lesser fair, who is weak, who is just docile. But he's firm, he's strong, he's focused, he's courageous. And he's also disciplined as a person. So that people can see all of these attributes in him and be able to learn. Now, the, 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 the word or the phrase servant leadership was made popular by one Robert Greenleaf. He's been there before, but he you know, brought it to limelight in an essay which he wrote in 1970, which he tried to describe what servant leadership is all about. And he says, the servant leader is first a servant before he becomes a leader. It begins with the natural feeling that one wants to serve. The desire. So anybody aspiring to leadership position does not aspire because he wants to get honor, prestige, glory, or money. But the quest, the push, the impetus is what? Service. So first they look at areas where people need service. And they say, I think I should go there. So it is in the course of service that they become identified as a leader. And that is true. That is what Christianity is about. It's first that we serve. And when we serve, then we are lifted up. The spiritual definition of servant leadership is found in the verses, passages I've written down. John 13, 3 to 5. What did Jesus do? He removed his outer garment, humbled himself, took a towel, wrapped around his waist, stooped low. You know, sometimes when we do the feet washing, we sit on a chair. I'm not sure Jesus sat on a chair. I think he had to stoop. And you know, when you do that for a couple of people, after the one, first, two, three, four, five, your back begin to ache. But Jesus endured until all 12 had their feet washed. Romans 5, 8 to 11, where we are still in sin, 
when there was no basis to redeem us when we were lost in sin what did he do he died for us he even loved us in our sin and so sometimes leaders are called no, I, don't, I don't think it's not i think all the time we are called to love the people under us that even as we correct them we don't correct to destroy them but we correct you know to to help them you know recover and be brought back to the kingdom the focus is the cure of souls that the person is redeemed and is brought back to the fold and then you have Philippians and of course Matthew 20, 20 25 to 28 that the one who is leader among you must be a servant and then Philippians that we talked about now let's let's look at the marks and the characteristics of servant leadership now these are just some it's not exhaustive I just picked this few and under each one there's a question and the first one there is a servant leader sacrificially seeks the highest joy of those he serves sacrificially spending time one of our hymns says spend and be spent so he spends is equally spent for what for the highest joy of those he serves and the question there is discuss both the spiritual and physical ways we can provide lasting joy fulfillment and peace in christ for those we serve and passages are there i like for us to quickly look at the questions you know pick any one that you want and then when i motion to you you want to answer please put up your hand and make make a comment it's bible study so it's interactive a servant leader sacrificially seeks the highest joy of those he serves so the question is we should discuss both the spiritual and physical ways we can provide this joy to those we lead whether in the church whether in public service you're a civil servant work in any ministry there are people under you in your office you are their leader how do you seek their highest joy you're a pastor you're a bishop people work under you you're a father you have a wife and children you are their spiritual leader yes I believe that uh, if you serve people and you, give, you make them to understand that you have a standard and you follow that standard in such a way that you don't bring in negative um, rules that will be the cheating of others. But rules that will be the same for everybody. So they may complain, but they will see the truth of it. And they will have confidence that if they wait, it will come to their turn. So I, uh, I think that uh, a servant leader should be fair to everyone. Fairness irrespective of background, region, or whatever. Mm. Thank you, Your Grace. So, fairness, providing a, a, a level playing field. A servant leader should do what? Provide a level playing field for everyone. And that would be one way of doing what? Of, you know, assisting them or providing them that lasting joy. Yes, any more? Yes, ma'am from Nehemiah. Nehemiah felt the pains of the people that mm. he was leading. Yes. He was an epitome of a servant leader. Mm. That he refused to collect what the governors before him 
were collecting mm. because he felt the burden that was upon the people that he has come to serve. Yeah. So a servant leader should always feel the burden of the people that he or she leads. Yes. Thank you, ma'am. So a servant leader should feel the pulse of his people. There should be feedback mechanism as a leader. You're always in front. You know, I, I, I once said to the clergy in the Daos, I said, you know, you people forget that, okay, our pews in Kaba are not like your own. They are still Paco. You have uh, some foam on yours. So we don't have foam yet, only for the bishop's wife and the clergy, the clergy wives. So I say, when you climb the pulpit and you spend so much time, you know, repeating yourself, repeating yourself, or you drag the service too long, don't forget that you are always sitting on foam, cushion chairs in the chancel. The members are sitting on hardwood, so their bomb bomb also gets tired. So feel their pause sometimes. You know, so put yourself in their shoes sometimes and understand what they feel and what they go through. So you can, you know, know how to manage your time and do things properly. Also to provide the highest joy, being fair and feeling the pause of the people. Yes, sir. The last one. Praise the Lord. A um, servant leader sacrificially seeks the highest joy of those he serves. Mm. Um, let me just give an analogy. You're, you're, you're heading a group in church, and then you have a member who has been steadfast. And then on this particular day, he comes late to church. And then you're wondering, and then you meet him. Ah, what happened? He said, ah, where's your family? Oh, we didn't, couldn't come to church because we didn't have money to pay transport. In fact, there's no food in the house. And he said, oh, my brother, it is well with you. <laughs> It is well with you would not translate to food. Meanwhile, you have money. Or you say, in fact, I have only 3,000 in my pocket. What makes you a servant leader is your ability to sacrifice that 3,000 okay. to give to that brother. Okay. Knowing fully well that that 3,000 naira could do a, it could change the setting around it. Because after service, it's obvious to you that that brother is still going to walk back home. Yeah. And then you're going home in your executive air-conditioned car. You are not, you're not, you're not like the mother hen who is supposed to sacrificially look after her chicks mm. for the joy. And as the children are being fed, you have, you have, you have a sense of fulfillment and satisfaction. Praise the Lord. Thank you, sir. So a servant leader must be practical. Practical. Uh, not just quoting scriptures, but uh, putting those scriptures to practice. May God help us in Jesus' name. The second one is, a servant leader seeks the glory of his master. His earthly master is not his reputation or his ministry constituency. That may draw some controversy. But the servant leader seeks first the glory of the heavenly master. And I would go to the question, is there anything really wrong in trying to please in press or make our leaders our bosses and masters comfortable for the servant leader his master heavenly master is number one but he has an earthly master too so when it's turned between the two which one should he obey first so the question is there is there anything wrong in making the leader comfortable give them a comfortable house good cars, fat salary, and the rest, the rest, the rest, the rest. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Biblically, there's nothing wrong in it. Okay. Morally, there's nothing wrong in it. As a leader, the higher you go, the more your responsibilities. Okay. And the more your responsibilities, the more needs you even have as a leader. Okay. For example, now, if it's grace, we have to be driving himself to this place while thinking of the synod. The thought is divided and there will be a problem. Mm. So it is the duty of the followers to make sure that the leaders are also comfortable yeah. in order to perform their duties. Thank okay. you. Sir. Yes. I want to read Ephesians uh, 6 verse 6. It says, obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ doing the will of God from your heart. Mm. Uh, so I think the key there is about eye service. Okay. There's nothing wrong in trying to make sure your 
leader is comfortable, mm. but when you're only doing it when he's around mm -hmm. to gain his favor, mm -hmm. to gain promotion or whatever it is that you're looking out for, but once he turns his back, you're doing something else. So that is, that is uh, clearly a, co a controversial kind of lifestyle. Mm. Be who you are, whether the leader is there yeah, or not. not. So le leaders must have discerning spirits to know those who are <laughs> into eye service, those who are licking your boots, psychophants. Yes, sir. Okay, ma. I'll take you as the last person. Quickly, please. I think there's nothing wrong when you give a leader the fatherly layer of office. Okay. But what is bad is when it is overdone. When it's overdone. Yes. For instance, yesterday at the sermon, the Bishop of um, Diocese of Award told us of a diocese where they created the office of the wife of the bishop. Okay. With all the paraphernalia of office. Yes. I think that's an overdone. So okay. we need to be careful in knowing the limit for which we provide comfort for our leaders. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So it, it means that you're great. Yes, sir. <laughs> Please, what Fagbemi was saying does not mean that there will be no mother's union office. I hope you understand that. Otherwise, the church will collapse. Thank you, Baba. <laughs> Thank you, Your Grace. Going back to what you just said, it means that there is no how that the Bishop of Kaba can be competing with the Bishop of Abuja Diocese. Do you, do you get my point? Because the location, the resources are not the same. Apart from that, the age and many other things are not the same. So it would be like a suicide mission for Kabadausis to intend to build a replica of St. Matthias' house in Kabadausis. Because I want to make him a name as a leader. Yes, ma'am. Praise the Lord. I feel there is nothing wrong taking care of our spiritual leaders. If our spiritual leaders are comfortable, their children's school fees are taken care of, accommodation taken care of, I believe they will have the time to even dwell in the world and know how to preach the gospel to the congregation. But we are by the, the necessary things of life okay. are not within their reach. Even if a member is called, that this member is there, you will say, my friend, I don't even know what I see in apostolic that I will be clapping all the time. Let me take care of my problem first. But if they are taken care of, they will have the time for us. They will time, have the time to preach the word. They will have the time to minister to us. Praise Thank you. Lord. So what will you consider? there will be problems, sir, yes. when there is excessiveness. Yes, what is that, what is that excessiveness? What is that extreme? Could you define it? Exactly, sir. So when members are taking care of your children's school fees, and those members, their children are in private and government schools, and you now come up to say, ah, my children will attend Turkish International. It's, it's, it's excessive, my sir. <laughs> <laughs> Praise the Lord. My Lord Bishop. <laughs> or buying a private jet for the private, for the private, for instance. Would that be excessive? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Praise the Lord. In my understanding, I agree with those who said there's nothing wrong with taking care of a leader, whether spiritual or whatever. The offices you have their demands yeah. on the leader. But the point is, how do we use those paraphernalias? Jesus had his glory before coming to the earth. But the Bible told us he emptied it. So when we have those things that are given to us, I don't even agree that there is or there may be an excess. Like a prophet said, if we buy him a private jet, he said he will carry us. The point there is how he uses the private jet, not in having it. When he has a private jet, 
and uses it for the people and not brag about it, there's nothing wrong with it. So whatever thing you have as a leader or whatever thing that, I give, that is given to you as a leader, the how of the usage is the matter. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. So a servant leader must understand that even in all of the abundance that he has at his disposal, he's first and foremost a servant. He's first and foremost what? A servant. And that attitude of being a servant must guide him in the usage and the demands that he makes on the people. Point three, those of you, those of you with your hands up, you would, you would attempt question three for me because of time. A servant leader will forgo his rights rather than obscure the gospel. A servant leader will do what? Forgo. There are times that he needs to do what? Forgo his rights. These are legitimate rights. He's not asking for anything extraordinary. But there are times when he has to do what? Forgo those rights. A servant leader's identity and trust are not in his calling, but in his Christ. Apostle Paul says, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win more of them. 1 Corinthians 9 verse 19. So the question here is, what did this mean for Paul? And what is the implication for us today? Yes. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Talking about um, foregoing his right rather than obscure the gospel. I think this is related to what I wanted to say in reference to what our mommy said. Um, she said, it is good to take care of our leaders but sometimes, according to her, if they're not well taken care of, it can hinder their work, make them not to be effective. And I want to say, based on this, that even if you are not well taken care of, I don't think that should impede the growth of the gospel. I don't think that should impede your performance. Because, like you said, our main call is to the Lord. So whether the things are there or not, we should plunge ourselves into the service. I want to take reference to what you said from the beginning, that to be a servant leader, the first push is to serve. So whether the conditions are okay or not, the push and the drive is not based on the conditions of service but the desire to what? To serve. So I want to say, in, in summary, whether the provisions are there or not, that should not be exalted beyond the need for the gospel to prosper anywhere Thank we you. are. Thank you. Yes, sir. I saw another hand there. That will be the last hand on that question. Okay, yes. I am always of the opinion that if you are a priest and you have not served in a parish, where you have to pay the transport fare of most of your parishioners back home, mm. your exposure and experience is incomplete. For us, as a priest, the life of those who are in rural areas are not less of importance to those of the city. So when we, are, we have to go to the rural area to do this work, we should remember our calling, go ye. So the, the, the command is not to city only, but to the bush as well. Okay, so, so a, a leader should have balanced all around experience. He should see the good, the bad, and the ugly. If a leader only sees the good all the time, uh, there could be some wahala. All right? Yes, ma, the lady in red. It is foregoing the right, actually that makes a leader a servant. Because if a leader is holding internationally, internationally on who he is and what he's supposed to get from the church, the congregation suffers. So from what you, you've said, we are noting that when certain privileges are not there, the, the, the basis of which a leader is called is not based on right and that is what is taking not several people away from the focus of achieving what God has called them because 
they sit down to calculate where and where they are and what they are going to gain. So before then they are entering, they already know their right and they are there to secure the right. So if a leader is not able to forego, to know that it is first about Christ, has nothing to do with my children's education, has nothing to do with how comfortable I am, it has everything to do that the name of the Lord will be glorified. He will achieve more. So that nothing is done against the kingdom and against the gospel. So that the preaching of the gospel remains intact. No matter what the leader goes through, the preaching of the gospel, the truth of the word of God remains the same. It could be hard. It could be difficult. But let me throw this at you, bounce it off you, and then we will not, we will not have time to discuss it. What about parents who influence the posting of their children for NYC? And uh, things like that, you know. Your son, your daughter is finishing university and you call up somebody in Lagos or in Abuja and say, uh, my son cannot go to this or that place, that other place. Or parents will say, ah, what I went through in life, I don't want my children to go through all of that. So from day one, they provide everything. So the child never gets to, you know, all those things that normal children, I call them normal children, go through. <laughs> they don't go through. Because daddy and mommy are always there to provide. So even when the child gets married, he's calling daddy, mommy, concerning issues about marriage and all of that. Uh, somebody said it is a helicopter parenting. You know, so the parents are always hovering around. You know, they talk to lecturers, talk to people everywhere. So they arrange and they fix everything. Some of these people are Christians, born again Christians, uh, tongue talkers, and sometimes miracle walking Christians. I'm just bouncing it off you as food for thought. Let's go to the fourth one. A servant leader is not preoccupied with personal visibility and personal recognition. Like John says, I'm only a voice. They asked him, who are you? He said, I'm just a voice. A voice of one crying out in the wilderness. And John was content to be known just as a friend of the bridegroom. Somebody once went to a program and they introduced him. They wanted to bring him to a high table. And they said, we'd like to in invite one of our guests, so-so and so, and they called his name, and he remained seated. And somebody said, they are talking to you. He said, no, that cannot be me. They have not put all the recursite titles that I have obtained. So I didn't pick it up in, the, in, in, in any way. I, 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 I studied for it, and I paid the price for it. So... Each time you introduce me anywhere in the public, you must put all of those things. The question is, how can we deal with the grace for power, position, and the unhealthy rivalry, envy, and bickering in the body of Christ today? The passages are there. Please pick one or so and make your comment. Anybody? This grace for power, grace for recognition. I want to be known, I want to be heard. How do we deal with that? Yes, I think the grace for power emanates from the perks of office. The from the perks of office. Okay. If an office is made unattractive. Okay. As a result, we have people who are genuinely concerned to serve. For instance, in our political life in this country, the perks of office are so much that it makes our leader to do everything, anything at all, to, to get, get there. The power. So I think if we can reduce the perks of office for our leaders, then we will have good servant leaders. Thank okay. you. So we should demystify some offices, if it's possible. Like you said, make them unattractive. Yes, sir. 
A servant leader, that means that there is a, God has given us the talent. Everybody has his own talent. You cannot, because you are in position, your brother did this, you post him where there is money, where he can stand and eat the whole money. So the servant leader should know the right place where you will post him, where he will walk. And uh, he has a constitution to defend. If you are going for serving God, you defend God's constitutions and make sure that you carry everybody along and Jesus carry everybody along. If you're in government, you make sure you carry everybody along. This, this time employment is now on. But the young one, we will have try our possible best to train our children. But to get employment, no way. Because we don't have, we are not in position. We are not in right position to give them job. And those who come out immediately as, they, as we are coming, they place you. Because you have father who can place you. And those ones which is lower grade, they recognize them. So, a, a servant leader should be somebody which God calls for that post. Don't post yourself by yourself. Okay. And God will help us in Jesus' name. Okay. So money or other fringe benefits should not be the motivation. But what we have today, is it not true that the first motivation for most leadership position is about what I can get? Except in the church. Even in the church. Even in the church. And I want you to say it and explain more. In the church, unless we are talking about maybe among the priests, but among parishioners, yes. there are people that recognize their calling, okay. that make themselves available to work, even using their own resources. Well, no, that's true. So that's th correct. That is where I'm going to. That's correct. There are people that are putting in much because of the position they are occupying in the church. Yes. At least I know some people no, personally. That's very correct. But so that's also where I'm going to. Yes. But when you talk about other offices, yes. I may not be able to talk about the house of the priest the and priest. all of that. I may yes. not be able to talk about them yes. so well. But outside the church, yes, people struggle for positions because of what they think they will, uh, they will gain out of it. Okay, t thank you, ma. What about people, see that, ma? What about people who have left the Anglican church to go to another church because they say, my business will be better enhanced in that place? So the, the motive for going to worship in that church is to get contracts. Or lay members of the church, even in our own church, who Infl you know, inflate the cost of projects or whatever is given to them by the church to do. They inflate it. I have a story of somebody who connived with the pastor of his church. This was for the roofing of the church and they shared the money into three parts. One part to the pastor, one part to the contractor, which is like, you know, excess uh, whatever, and then the last part, which is the third part, for doing the roofing. You know what happened? During Sunday worship, the structure collapsed. This is a member of the church, and this is a pastor of the same church, who did not care about the safety and the welfare and the life of their members. But all they wanted was the money. We have people in our church sometimes who serve in various committees because of what they want to get. Not because they want to actually offer service. So that is not servant leadership. It's not. I, I saw a hand there. Okay. Okay, quickly because of time. I, brief, brief, then Venerable will say something. We still have one or two more questions. Thank you very much, sir. Coming to the first question you raised in point four, that the big rain, the position, creates for power in the body of Christ. I believe we have a beautiful revelation of God's word in John chapter 3, verse 27. It says, John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him yes. from heaven. Yes. And that is to say that 
Many people will nurse ambitions. It is good to be ambitious. In fact, you may nurse it, you may have it. When you are not ambitious, people will say, what are you thinking? What are you doing your life, your life for? Mm. But this great revelation is telling us that even though you nurse it, if it is not from God, you cannot get it. Mm. So the body of Christ must know that whatever we have or whoever we have, it is from God. Thank you. Somebody has said that those who look for power know exactly what to do with it. Can I say that again? Those who look for power, they know exactly what to do with it. But people who are not eager to have power or position, they don't really know what to do with it. But those who are doing everything, they hold this leg, hold that hand, pay money, bribe, do this campaign, they know exactly. I don't want to say only politicians, but even in the church it happens. Politicians, yes, in our country, that's a bad example of how they come campaigning. They go to the remotest village during campaign. But once they are elected for the four years, they never remember that village. But it's the same thing in the church. So when we look for this power, there's something in our mind. There's something we intend to achieve. Sometimes, basically, it's not for the sake of the kingdom. It's for us. And servant leadership says, no. If we actually want to lead, it should be motivated, inspired by the spirit of service and the spirit of Christ. David was nowhere near becoming a king. You know the story very well. But they fished him out. They said, we will not sit. That's what Samuel said. Until he what? Until he comes. The next question there, or the next point there is that a servant leader or servant leader anticipates and graciously accepts the time for his decrease, retirement, and completion of assignment. John chapter 3, 29, 30. John says, I must decrease that he may what? Increase. He says, I'm only a voice. I'm only a forerunner. I'm only a friend of the bridegroom. He says, in fact, I'm not worthy to baptize him. But Jesus insisted and said, no, you must do it to fulfill scripture. If not, John says, now that you have come, I'm redrawing. You are the one I was waiting for. You are the one I was preparing the grounds for. And now that you have arrived, please have your way. And the question there is, why do we have sit tight leaders today, even in the church? And how can the church influence secular leadership? What about Christian involvement in politics? Why do we have sit tight leaders in Nigeria? Not just in the country, even in the church. In Africa. <laughs> yes, sir. Sit tight leadership is only possible when there is no complete and organic condition for leadership. Okay. Every leadership position must have a condition. The church set an example, for instance. An archbishop cannot be in position first for the first five years, then if he has done well for another five years. After that, he must step aside. Okay. That's a good example. But in our national or political leadership, we don't have that. We have, for instance, senators who are already past 75. So why, sir? Why? why? Because there was, there's been no condition laid down okay. for when you step out of that leadership okay. position. That's point number one. Point number two, we don't have uh, a, a set of factors for the performance of the leadership role for majority of our leadership positions outside the church. Mm. For instance, we don't have the manifesto of a politician for stepping into political office. He will promise a lot of things, but that doesn't make a manifesto. It's not set down, it's not a law, that's nothing that catches him. Mm. But if we have a situation that says, these are the set of things you must take, you must do yeah. before you finish your term. If your term is over and you haven't finished it, you still go. Okay. Then we will be able to find, find leaders who will perform, or if they don't perform, still go at their set time. Okay. 
These are necessary things that are happening in other places. Mm. A man who wants to be in the House of Assembly, for instance, says, while I'm in the House of Assembly, this is what I'm fighting for in those four years. And this is how I'm going to fight for them. Okay. This is how I hope I will achieve them. Okay. If in the first year, yeah. he's just planning. Yeah. In the second year, he's still planning. In the third year, he's still planning. In the fourth year, he must go. Thank you, sir. That is equally applicable to the church. Don't forget that there are people who have sworn affidavits. <laughs> this thing called the Eighth Declaration in Nigeria. You can just walk into any court and uh, redeclare your age. And uh, somebody signs for you and you, are, you return and become 45 when you are 65. Praise the Lord. I think one of the reasons why we have sit tight leaders is because of the fear of tomorrow, mm. the fear of the future, mm. and because of um, poverty mentality. Thank you. I mean, that, that's, that's very true, venerable. Fear of tomorrow, you have not planned. So leaders, leadership, uh, servant leadership must do what? Plan for tomorrow. When you're going to retire. So you don't keep... Uh, Yes, Dad. Um, leader, what she said has connection with the fight against corruption. It's not just an item. The fear of tomorrow, if you go to the civil service, the salary is known. A good number of the civil servants don't live in Abuja, actually because they cannot pay. They can pay. They can afford it. Now, such people, the government is policing them. You must not take bribe. You must not do like this. You must not do like that. They have no savings, actually, because by the end of the month, the whole salary has been expended, and it starts all over again. He will continue in this recurring decimal till the retirement comes on him. After calculating it, he sees the person who retired before him. In the village, he's looking for, to his brother to share apartment. His wife and the wife of the brother had to quarrel over kitchen and so on and so forth. And so the man will decide not to die. Yes, it, it will take bribe. So what I'm, the point I'm making is, if the government really wants to fight corruption, there are certain things that it must do, it's a kind of structural adjustments mm. to ensure that people are a bit more comfortable mm. and the salary that they earn is for them. In a family where you have five young people, only one person is employed. The one who is employed has to share These, uh, his money. Yeah. Eventually, all of them become unemployed. Yes. Yes. That's so, true. it is if you are fighting corruption, bring more employment, pay pensions, so that my father will not depend on me, my mother will not depend on me. Mm. The concept of salary mm. is that is for one person. Not for a family. Thank you, Baba. <laughs> These are practical issues that we all live in day, you know, day in, day out. Yes, Venerable. Oh, there are a few more hands at the back. Oh, okay. Venerable, quickly, so I can take um, Thank you very people much, as sir. well. When we address issues like this, we should not take the church as homogeneous. The church is heterogeneous. Okay. We have different types of people. Yes. And to address this issue of sit tight, we should not look at retirement alone. Mm. Even among we clergy, I've seen an evil thing. And this evil thing is the fault of the clergy, is the fault of the lady. For example, when a priest is transferred from a parish mm. as the vicar mm. to another parish, yeah. there are some members of that former parish who still hold their allegiance to the one that has left and they will want to consult him in everything. 
even at times, making him an examiner of the new person. That is wrong. And it behoves, I mean, it's on the, the honor side, it's on the priest that the bishop will transfer you is not an ignoramus. The bishop knows the reason why he transfer you from that church to another church. Okay. You see myself as an example. I left Lagos. Do you know that even two, three, four months after I left Lagos, some people still want to do something and also they will be calling me in Abuja. I say, go to your vicar. So we vicars or we priests also know that when you are transferred you away are transferred. from the church, disengage. Yeah. But I, I agree with you, sir. I agree with you. But don't forget that ministry is such that it involves relationships. So I'm, I'm not expecting that once the, the, the vicar of St. Matthews leaves here to another church, that half of the church will follow him there. No. But I understand that if members have occasions of celebration, that the vicar will come. And that there are also certain individuals who would ask him, please, could you pray for us on this matter? Or we want your counsel on this matter. Yes, so that, I think that at that level is okay. Yes, the, at the back. Quickly, we must wrap up with the last question. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Your Grace, for the... No, I'm still my Lord Bishop. No, I'm, I'm, refer I'm referring to, the, to His Grace for the comments. <laughs> For his comment he just made now concerning the fear, <laughs> concerning the fear of life after retirement. Yes. You see, I think it's high time the church realizes the fact that the present day leadership, especially in our country, has not denied the fact that it's a bit helpless on, attack, on tackling the issue of unemployment and even the issue of salaries, issue of minimum wage, and so, 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 so on. I think in the history of the church, this is one of the best opportunities that the church can utilize its resources in creating alternative sources of income for its members and parishioners. Because on the average, what is grace just enumerated now is the reality. The basic salary of a civil servant, level 10, level 12, they may not even be able to have a saving, especially those in Abuja. And even in the states, some states are not even lucky as those in Abuja that they've not been paid for months. Like my state. Kogi state. That's true, sir. <laughs> so if the church can use the opportunity we have now, when I say the church, I don't mean only the Anglican church. The Anglican church has been doing very well in creating industries and schools and things that can be a source of empowering its members. Other churches... Some have used their money in buying private jets, like it was mentioned now. And you know what it means to service some of these jets and some of these luxuries. Yeah, so if yeah, they can yeah. cut down luxuries and use, divert these luxuries to empowerment schemes vigorously, I think the fear of life after retirement will be at least reduced to the barest minimum. Thank you Thank very you. much. God bless you. The last question there is, what should be the attitude, behavior, and reaction of a servant leader when it comes to the following. There are many of them. One, suffering. Two, money and materialism. Three, alcohol. D, or four, women. Position, power, and ambition. Tribal groupings and affinity. Marriage relationship between spouses. Just I take one or two people just to make comments on anyone Yes, sir. I see a hand there. Just brief comments, please. Well, most of the discussion has centered around our priests and their services. But I'm going to look at this question, last question, from this perspective of Nigeria as a nation. Okay. And looking at question E, position and power, and looking at tribal grouping and affinity, and relating it to the last question we addressed, which has to do with uh, seatite in office. In our nation, Nigeria, a leader feels insecure, feels he represents a group rather than the nation 
And when you started this topic, you stressed that the leader should be fair. The leader should be for all and not for a few. Part of what causes insecurity and sit tight for our leaders is that our leaders see themselves as serving are there for a few. They are not there for the whole nation. You recycle a group of persons because they are from your ethnic grouping. You, you want to remain in office even if it means going for four times, four tenors, if it means that you are representing the interests of your group, I was reading a critic of our former president who had always criticized the past presidents in this country. And people said, we know what he's fighting for. He wished he could represent only his group. And that was why he was seeking for a third tenor and probably he could go for a fifth tenor. That criticism is not for him alone. It applies to a group of Nigerian leaders. They see themselves, or we see ourselves, as representing our ethnic grouping. Okay, sir. Representing our churches, or representing even our villages. Mm -hmm. And the servant leader should avoid this booby trap. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. God bless you. I would like to marry E and the uh, question five from Batu. That is about influencing, influence on secular leadership. Mm. You know, um, I think it's important that the church also have a stake in secular leadership. Sure. And the only, only way you can have a stake is by making investments for example, uh, in the last election, the church really advertised a member for people to come up, especially leaders uh, within the church uh, folk. But yeah. I discovered that I contested the election also. Okay. But I discovered that what we hear in the church is not necessarily what even what we see in the field. Sometimes you, you find yourself alone in mm. the field. Mm. And then when you make attempt the first time and you see that even the support you should get may not necessarily be even financial support from the church, the next time you get prepared to go either by crook or by the right way. And I, I, hope, but I hope to see anybody who is elected here, I mean in, this, in the election, that actually with the system with which the election was held, yes. that actually came out that can be bold to say that he, there was no manipulation that from the, I contest at the grassroots level at yes. Cancelo, yes. that there was, the, it was just the everything that the Lord Almighty took over and he just won the election. I believe if the church also, because when the, the people in power see that the church have influence even in determining who becomes the leader, they, be, they even listen to you. But when you have not even, they, they don't see you as an influence, as a threat. You can make all the noise. They know what they're going to do and they will stick to doing it. Before the election, some people approached us to give them money. But in a church where you have APC, you have PDP, you have Labour Party, you have SDP, and, and, this, and, and a candidate from a particular party comes to ask for money and you give the, such a person the money of the church I think it is not fair that is the major weakness of criticizing the church that they didn't give money because the church belongs to all if they now bring out the money of everybody and give to a person from a particular party you are already initiating crisis so this is the problem. It's not that they don't wish you well or they don't want to come out with you. The, the politics in Nigeria truly is a money politics. But how the money will, will come by it, I don't know. I know of people who went to the bank 
to take loan. But unfortunately also, they lost. Oh, yes. Thank you, sir. I know that Baba has always supported uh, the idea of Christians, and particularly Anglicans, getting involved in politics. And God will help us in Jesus' name. The conclusion, the summary of it is two words. Character and integrity. Basically the same thing. A servant leader must have character. It's not possible for a servant leader to be doing good, you know, and people praise him and say, oh man, he's, he's done this, he's done that, you know. Or maybe sometimes in terms of physical achievements, okay, or even maybe spiritual achievement, you know, programs and what have you. But when you come to the character of the individual, when you come to the integrity of the individual as touching money, as touching the opposite sex, as touching issues of um, tribalism, and many other areas that we know, they will find the person wanting. For Jesus, he was not just that servant leader who was saying a lot of things to his disciples. But he was equally demonstrating these things. So his life was an open scripture, open Bible for the disciples to read, to see, to copy, and to follow. No wonder he says, I have done this and living for you an example to follow. Servant leaders must live credible examples. Examples that will live long after they are off the scene. Character and integrity. I'm not sure the hymn is going to be displayed for us, so we'll just pray. Shall we pray? Can you talk to God and ask that the things we have discussed, the Lord will help us. Every one of us to be a true servant leader. That the characteristics, the nature, and the person of Christ as exemplified in servant leadership will be our lifestyle. Thank you, Heavenly Father. We give you glory. We give you praise. We know that you will help us that our lives will be transformed and our leadership style will change for the better. That we shall be true servants, serving you first and foremost, and then serving your people. Blessed be your name. Take charge, O oh God, of the rest of the proceedings for today, and let your name be honored. For we pray in Jesus' name.